Good morning, everybody. My name is Julian Nordyke. I'm with University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute, and we are here to welcome you to the seventh annual Clean Bay Backers event on restoring the health of the Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay. Uh, the communities that make up Northeast Wisconsin are intricately tied to one of the greatest natural resources on the planet. All of our, um, oh, oops, all right. Of all the water on earth, less than 1% is fresh water that is available through our lakes, rivers, and streams. The Great Lakes, the largest freshwater system on earth, makes up 20% of that under 1%. More simply, as communities within the Lake Michigan Basin, we are responsible for one-fifth of the world's water supply. For thousands of years, the Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay have provided spiritual spirituality, food, jobs, recreation, and quality of life for its people and surrounding communities. So today we are here to celebrate the successes and restoration uh, and learn more about what we need to do to be stewards of this incredible asset for ourselves and our children and grandchildren. On the agenda today, we have a great lineup of speakers who will be talking about regional water quality and public health issues. There will be a Q&A session after each major topic area. Uh, at any time during the presentations, we strongly encourage you to type in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So some of those Q&As come um, at a time. Uh, so after we'll do one after the PCB Fox, the Fox River and the PCB cleanup. Um, oops, and then addressing the challenges of agricultural runoff, and then also after the emerging issues as panels. Make, please make sure to check out your agenda packets that you were sent. I apologize if people did not receive the email due to size limits. Um, and there was an email this, just recently uh, this morning that should have included links to be able to download. In your agenda packets, you'll find speaker contacts, links to many resources, and additional information about the topics discussed today. Um, so, uh, let's see. With that, I think what we're going to do, we're gonna start with some opening remarks by our uh, federal legislator, legislatures. So we first have uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher. Uh, Mike, uh, Congressman Gallagher was uh, supposed to be here live this morning, but um, there was a last minute change in his schedule and he had to, uh, uh, he had to uh, go to Washington DC this morning and so he's probably taking off from the airport right now actually. <laughs> so uh, we have the, uh, video uh, opening remarks from both uh, Congressman Gallagher and Senator Tammy Baldwin. Um, so uh, Congressman Gallagher, uh, let's see, I'll stop this. There we go. And just say that Congressman Guy Mike Gallagher represents Wisconsin's 8th district in the U.S. of Representatives. House of Representatives. In Congress, he has demonstrated the, his commitment to protecting water resources through his Save the Bay initiative, which brings together leaders in agriculture, academia, industry, government, and nonprofit leaders to identify, share, and promote conservation practices to reduce phosphorus, nitrogen, and sediment flowing into the waters of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. He also serves as a Great Lakes Task Force and consistently supports supported increased funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Hi guys, Congressman Mike Gallagher here with Grace. That's Grace, don't look at the screen. Don't look at the screen, that's bad for you. Uh, I am sorry I can't be with you in person, um, but uh, I think I'm on a plane right now, if the timing is correct headed to DC from Green Bay for the week. So I wanna thank you for getting together. Uh, thank you for your engagement on this important issue. You're there today because you, know, you share the basic idea that the Great Lakes are a national treasure. They not only support more than 20% of the world's fresh water, but they support thousands of family sustaining jobs and provide for our way of life. And, and nothing is more important to our community than the health of our water. And we can't take any threats to our ecosystem lightly. And while it's obvious that Congress can't agree on much nowadays, on this issue, I would submit Republicans and Democrats uh, know that we must come together to protect this resource and 
One way we've done so is through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. As you know, these dollars support projects like the Fox River Superfund site completed earlier this year. This is one of many examples of how impactful GLRI is to Northeast Wisconsin and why I've worked across the aisle to secure increased funding for GLRI. Um, but while the completion of the Fox River Superfund site is certainly a cause for celebration, it's also a reminder that we have much more work to do. And at a time when we're seeing contaminants like PFAS threatening our rivers, our streams, our lakes, the stakes are simply too high for us to sit on our hands. And that's why in addition to helping secure more GLRI funding, I've also worked to require that PFAS manufacturers, processors, and producers report their usage of these chemicals to the EPA so that we at least have an understanding of where these toxins come from. And earlier this year, I was encouraged that the House passed the PFAS Action Act, which I supported, which designates PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances, uh, substances, excuse me, um, substances, Grace, to ensure that all those responsible for contamination uh, do their part to clean up and restore our waters and our habitats. And there are, of course, other PFAS-related policies that are currently being considered in the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. And I'm actually cautiously optimistic that we can get them across the finish line. And so I just say that to say, you know, there's been a lot of progress in a bipartisan fashion, maybe small steps, but they're important steps to ensuring that the state of the Bay is healthy and uh, that we can build upon the work that we've done. So I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that we can protect this vital resource, not just today, but for generations to come so that when Grace is, is an adult, uh, she can enjoy clean water in Northeast Wisconsin. So thank you so much. I wish I could be with you uh, in person, um, but I look forward to the day when we're all allowed to be together in person too. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, and then we have also this morning uh, some opening remarks from Senator Baldwin. Senator Tammy Baldwin is a leading defender of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, forging a successful agreement between Republicans and Democrats to restore proposed cuts to the program. She fights for funding, program, f funding this program not only because it is an important environmental goal, but also she recognizes the Great Lakes Restoration as an economic necessity for Wisconsin. Senator Baldwin has also contributed to and sponsored several other water-related legislation to promote coastal economic ecosystem and community resilience, including the Water Resources Development Act, the Waterfront Community Revitalization and Resilience Act of 2018, and the Digital Coast Act. So with that, uh, we will hear some opening remarks from Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tammy Baldwin, and welcome to this year's State of the Bay. While today's activities look a little different this year, it's exciting that so many folks are joined together to recognize the importance of Green Bay to the economy, quality of life, and future of the region. When we work together to restore and protect the health of our Great Lakes, bays, estuaries, lakes, and rivers, we are working to secure the future for the next generation. Thank you to the Clean Bay backers for bringing elected officials, community leaders, and stakeholders together today, and for your continued work restoring the health of the Lower Fox River and Bay of Green Bay. Today we're discussing our shared goal of doing everything we can to improve our water quality, address agriculture runoff, enhance coastal and waterfront resiliency, and to protect and preserve the Great Lakes. We know the Great Lakes are a critical part of Wisconsin's economy. And the Great Lake Restoration Initiative has earned bipartisan support in Congress and is critical for the health of our region, our communities, and our clean water resources. It helps us clean up polluted sites, restore water quality, and combat invasive species. It's provided critical resources to improve the Bay of Green Bay and put local experts to work on local projects. We all know how important the Great Lakes are to our economy and quality of life. So I'm gonna keep fighting for full funding to protect our Great Lakes. And I will also keep working to pass my legislation to boost our waterfront communities, because it's not just an environmental goal, it's an economic necessity for our state. 
The Wisconsinites who live in waterfront communities and the many businesses that rely on healthy waterfronts need better, faster solutions to address these growing water quality challenges. This is needed to revitalize our waterfronts and promote economic development. I am so proud to be your partner in the United States Senate to help accomplish these goals and protect our water quality for future generations. Thank you for your hard work and have a great day. Great. We really thank our federal uh, representatives uh, for uh, providing those opening remarks. And we do wish that, um, that they could be here today. Um, so I was remiss a little bit earlier before we start with the presentations. Uh, one of the biggest thank yous that I wanted to give, so I would need to share, uh, share my screen. Um, this event today uh, would not be possible without the Clean Bay backers. Uh, we are a citizens group of volunteers and organizations uh, that, that really help focus on providing uh, elected officials and community leaders around this region with experiential, uh, typically experiential tours to really uh, showcase the challenges and successes of uh, restoring the health of the lower Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay. Uh, and it's these people that you see on this slide that have made this this uh, event possible for you today. And um, I just wanted to make sure that folks know in the, in the audience um, what a great group of people this is and, and, that, um, and that I'm really thankful to be working with them all. So, okay. So with that, uh, we will turn it over to um, uh, Bree, Bree Kupski. Stop sharing, okay. And Bree Kupski is the Lower Green Bay and Fox River Area of Concern uh, Coordinator. Uh, and she's going to be giving us a progress, an update on progress of restoring the health of the Lower Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay. So Bree, if you wanna um, start your video and share your screen. All right, everybody able to see me, hopefully. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Julia, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to take the next few minutes to share some highlights on um, many decades of effort to remediate and restore the Fox River and Bay of Green Bay and how this work has and continues to help revitalize our local community. Um, but before I get started, um, I just really want to thank everybody on the Clean Bay Backers for all their hard work to host these great annual events um, to really get the word out about progress that's been made and to highlight these issues that we still need to invest more time and resources in to really see that restoration of the Fox River and Bay of Green Bay um, realized. So I wanted to start out by giving you all some context on the area of concern program. Um, there are 43 areas of concern throughout the Great Lakes region with 31 located in the US. Um, and what really characterizes these areas is that they're often urbanized and industrialized harbors where you know, there's a lot of sediment contamination, um, which poses a really significant risk to human health as well as um, impacts to fish and wildlife. And because they're so contaminated, they also pose this threat to a larger area of the Great Lakes system. Um, so they're highly prioritized for remediation and restoration efforts. Um, in Wisconsin, there uh, were five areas of concern that were originally designated. The Lower Menominee River is the first in Wisconsin that actually just had its designation removed um, because we completed all the work needed to get it out of a really se severely degraded category. So that was a, um, an important and exciting milestone for the state. And I find it really helpful to look into the historical context to communicate why these areas were designated in the first place. Um, so some examples of why are things like in Marinette, um, where the Lower Menominee River area of concern, where there had been a 30 foot high pile of arsenic salts that had been running off into the Menominee River and contaminating surface water and groundwater resources for years. Um, untreated wastewater containing detergents cause huge foams to pile up along the banks of the Sheboygan River. And in Milwaukee, there are records of actually being able to light um, Lincoln Creek on fire due to all the petroleum runoff. And of course, in Green Bay, there were reports, you know, back in the late 1870s that fish like sturgeon, you know, were once so plentiful that commercial fishermen used to stack them like cordwood to get rid of them because they damaged their nets. Um, then compare those reports to newspaper articles like this one in 1921, just 50 years later, that described how no, nearly no fish were able to exist in the East or Fox Rivers. Um, and these headlines were actually pretty common um, even past this article. 
1961 describing a major fish kill in the river um, where tons of dead fish had to be removed. The same article also shows pictures of DDT being sprayed directly on the water. So just a few short years, what had been one of the most productive fisheries in Wisconsin and even the Great Lakes region had become, you know, almost completely unsuitable for life, largely due to major industrial activity and urbanization um, that degraded water quality. And of course, this history also caused problems with public health and aesthetic value along the Fox River and Bay of Green Bay. Um, many of the sources of these problems were eventually cut off through initiation of policies such as the Clean Water and Clean Air Act, as well as other state and local regulations and initiatives. But we still had this major problem with how to deal with all these legacy pollutants. Um, there really wasn't a pathway to get these sites remediated and restored. And that's really what prompted this area of concern designation. Um, so each of the Great Lakes states worked with technical experts, local leaders, and the community to come up with um, a remedial action plan that described the problems in each area and a means of addressing these problems. Um, so for the Lower Green Bay and Fox River Area of Concern Remedial Action Plan, that was the first to be developed in the US and the problems that were identified generally fit within three major categories. We needed to address contaminated sediments, degraded water quality, and um, degraded fish and wildlife populations and habitat. So how are we doing in those three categories? Um, I'm just gonna touch on contaminated sediment first, um, which was really a problem because of the PCBs that were released into the Fox River. My colleague Beth will talk um, um, a bit more about PCBs and how they impact human and fish and wildlife in just a moment, but I just wanted to mention a couple of highlights. So over the last 15 years, enough contaminated sediment was remediated that if you were to load all that sediment into dump trucks and line them up, they'd span from the city of Green Bay all the way to London, England, so a lot of sediment. Um, this project was paid for in full by responsible parties and not taxpayers, and there were around 140 workers on site daily which brought a talented workforce that lived, worked, and played here for over a decade, um, enhancing our local economy. So there are a lot of direct and indirect benefits as a result of this project, um, and its completion represents one of the most significant milestones in the remediation and restoration of the Fox River and Bay of Green Bay. Another thing we've been working on through coordination with many different partners is improving that fish and wildlife habitat. Um, one of the figurehead projects is the Cat Island Restoration Chain um, that had been identified as a need back in that first remedial action plan from 1988. And it became a reality in 2013 through just incredible persistence and coordination of many partners and community members. Um, we've also been working for the last few years with a similar group to come up with a list of different project areas and concepts for habitat improvement because there is a lot more work um, needed um, in this sphere, and we're really hoping to get some exciting projects off the ground, or on the ground, excuse me, over the next few years. And of course, there's so many partners contributing to improving fish and wildlife habitat through things like Brown County's efforts to restore pike spotting marshes. Um, many projects were and continue to be made possible through natural resource damage assessment funds and contributions, and there's just too many great projects um, to name here, but a lot of great incremental work that's been accomplished over the last few decades. As far as our last major category, I think a lot of us know that improving water quality is a big work in progress for this region. Um, every year in spring or after big rainstorms, we see pictures like the one on the left showing tons of stormwater runoff entering the bay, which is really what's fueling these algae blooms that um, both degrade water quality and impact fish and wildlife, um, but also pose a pretty significant health risk, which you'll hear more about later in this virtual event. And a lot of where this is coming for, from is sources that are not easy to pinpoint um, and therefore difficult to regulate within that larger watershed context. So our program is one of several um, that are working together with agricultural producers and communities to find ways to reduce stormwater runoff. And it's gonna take more work, more people, and more investment than what we're currently seeing in this region to get after this issue. Um, and we'll delve into that a little bit more during this event as well. So I often get asked how a lot of this work is funded, um, and much of it comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Init Initiative, or GLRI, which was um, initiated back in 2010. You heard from Senator Baldwin and Congressman Gallagher about the importance of GLRI um, and its strong bipartisan support, and I just want to echo that point. Um, so what you're seeing here um, uh, on the right is a graph that shows years on the bottom and environmental problems or impairments removed in areas of concern on the left. And you'll see that the removal of these problems was actually pretty slow before the onset of GLRI in 2010. And now we see that these problems um, are being removed at a much faster rate. So, so this initiative has been really instrumental in getting the resources needed to really clean up these um, severely contaminated areas. But even beyond making progress in areas of concern, um, the GLRI has really generated some very important economic and social benefits as well. 
Uh, the picture on the left shows how much GLRI funding has been awarded by a congressional district from 2010 excuse me, to 2019 in Wisconsin. And there's been over $165 million invested to support over 300 projects in districts six and eight. Um, and a recent study found that for every dollar of GLRI funding invested, there's around a $3.35 return um, on investment to local communities and additional economic activity through things like increased tourism, property values, and just general quality of life improvements. We see evidence of this in places like Marinette through increased tourism at Menakani Harbor. Um, the harbor area had been polluted, um, it had a lot of excess sediment, had unsafe shorelines, poor fish and wildlife habitat, and through GLRI, as well as state and local investments, um, today the harbor is cleaner, deeper, and supports much more recreation than it did before. Um, so one example of this is that there was a national walleye fishing tournament back in 2017, which brought in an estimated um, $1 million to that local economy in just one weekend. We also see um, in this in communities like Sheboygan, where restoration and remediation work um, completed in the river and harbor has contributed to these formerly contaminated industrial sites being reimagined and revitalized uh, into valuable real estate with more than 400 new housing units under development um, along the waterfront. And that reflects nearly a $70 million investment in this community. And of course, we're seeing some of the same benefits right here in Green Bay and the surrounding communities um, where much of our shoreline has been redeveloped over the past several years to provide more housing and commercial units, lots of recreational opportunities um, through, you know, new public areas like the city deck and the Fox River Trail. And we really see this community turning and facing the water again. Um, and as somebody who's raising three kids in this community, um, I'm very excited about all the ways that we keep making this a great place to live, work and play. Um, still have a lot more to do, but I think that everybody who works to make this community better should be very proud of the progress that's been made so far. And hopefully this event will help keep that energy and focus um, in all of us to keep working toward making our waterways and Great Lakes resources healthier every day. And so with that, thank you for joining today. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to call or email me. Great. Thank you, Bree. Much appreciated. Okay, so we are going to continue to keep going. Um, again, I encourage people, if you have questions as you, uh, for our speakers, uh, please put them in the webinar chat. Otherwise, there's going to be some very awkward silence for a while after these. So uh, please uh, get those questions in the chat box for us. Um, our next speaker is Beth Olson. And Beth, at this point in time, if you could um, start your video and unmute yourself and start sharing your screen, that would be great. Good morning. Beth Olson is a field, good morning, Beth. <laughs> Beth Olson is a field integration director and project manager at the Department of Natural Resources. Beth oversees several complex environmental projects and has been managing the state's oversight team for the Lower Fox River PCB cleanup for 11 years so far. Beth is one, one of many people uh, work at, in this project who has worked tirelessly to see clean and safe water realized for all those who work, live, and play on the Fox River in the Bay of Green Bay. So thank you, Beth, uh, for being here, uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. It is wonderful to join everyone today and celebrate completion of the PCB work after 17 years of striving for the finish line in the Lower Fox River. And we reached it this summer. It's a monumental achievement on a scale that's never been done before. Finishing this phase of the project means a stronger foundation for restoring natural resources and supporting local communities on a grand scale. Long ago, people did turn their backs on this river, often treating it as a sewer, but now communities and people are facing the river and improving the shoreline with new development projects and nature trails. Some of the pictures you're seeing today in Bree's presentation in here show you the scale of the work that's being done. Thanks to the PCB cleanup project, we have a cleaner environment to help people and wildlife thrive. This project is a model for the power of we and what humans can do when we work together to achieve goals. So Wisconsin DNR is extremely proud of the work done on this project and on all the dedication by many people beyond this project. We're grateful for that dedication to future work by local communities, leaders, educators, 
our federal partners and representatives, conservation professionals, and many others who are supporting clean water and a healthier environment. So before I start the slideshow, I wanna give you some fast facts about the project itself. Over six and a half million cubic yards of contaminated sediment were removed by hydraulic dredging. Uh, you heard Bree say they would stretch from Green Bay to London, and that's for all the sediment, including what was removed and what was uh, isolated under caps. So the other calculation we like to do to give you an idea of how much six million cubic yards is, is it would fill Lambeau Field with sediment to the top over six times. That's a lot of sediment. In addition to hydraulic dredging pulling out the sediment, it pulls out a lot of water and clean sand. 10 billion gallons of water were treated and returned to the river, and over 800,000 tons of clean sand were used in upland projects, including the highway system you see around Green Bay. Because of this project, the river is much, much cleaner now, and overall recovery of this river in the bay has been accelerated. So we'll go through some slides to tell you about this project, one of the largest of its kind worldwide. Why do we have to get rid of PCBs? PCB stands for polychlorinated biphenyl, and it's a group of toxic chemicals created by Monsanto long ago. Historically, it was used in paper making, which is how it ended up in the Fox River. PCBs are bad for humans and wildlife. They build up in biological organisms, which is what bioaccumulation means. So you can see in the chart on the right, as the sediment with PCBs uh, becomes available to organisms, it moves up to the food chain concentrating in fish and in birds and ultimately in humans. This project took a long time to get off the ground by a lot of dedicated people in this area and in Washington and Chicago EPA. The project was handled and managed as segments of the river known as operable units. And there were five, starting at Lake Winnebago where the Lower Fox River flows northward up to the Bay of Green Bay. There's 39 miles of river and overall, the goal was to protect human health and the environment. Government agencies did the oversight here, and what's unusual and unique is it was a state lead site. It was never technically listed on the national priorities list under Superfund, and that was a decision made by Wisconsin's governor working with EPA decades ago to not have a listed Superfund site here in the Fox Valley in the Bay, but instead to use that law to direct the cleanup and to require the parties responsible for the pollution to pay for it. We worked very closely with EPA as our federal partner and we do that to this day on a weekly and daily basis. EPA is the enforcement lead. And there was a time when we had to go to court in 2012 and sue a number of companies uh, using United States Department of Justice and Wisconsin's Department of Justice attorneys who did a great job in winning that suit and forcing the cleanup to proceed at full scale. The responsible parties that remain active on the river are NCR Corporation, Flat Felter, and Georgia Pacific. They're doing all the work and they're paying reimbursement all the costs for DNR and EPA to oversee it. We are working together collaboratively. It's a really great relationship that again shows the power of we. Here's a timeline of this project. Back in the 50s and into the early 70s, that's when PCBs were discharged to the river in wastewater. That was related to carbonless copy paper, a new innovation at the time, but no one checked on the toxicity of PCBs and they really didn't get regulated until the 70s. EPA banned those, a DNR issued fish consumption advisories, and then the studies began on where the PCBs were in the river, in the bay, and how to remove them. By the turn of the century, there was a formal remedial investigation and feasibility study to figure out, could it be done by dredging and capping? And the answer was yes. In 2004, the work began up in Little Lake Butamore, right where the Lower Fox River flows out of Lake Winnebago. And it's continued for 17 years in segments along the river. The good news is we finally reached the finish line at the mouth of the Fox River this summer, and we completed all of the capping. So what's next is in 2021, next year, we uh, get to begin long-term monitoring in that very last stretch of river. The good news is we started that type of monitoring upstream 10 years ago. So we have some good data for upstream recovery and we look forward to starting the monitoring at the end of the river next year. And then in 2022, we will monitor the entire river every five years 
will also continue overseeing the monitoring of engineered caps forever. So the Lower Fox River is on a strong road to recovery. That's important for the wildlife that eat the fish. And it was done through this hydraulic dredging. You'll see in the bottom right, a uh, picture of a hydraulic dredge with a cutter head that does a very uh, low impact removal of sediment, water, and sand. To get an idea of what happened each year, this chart shows you the years on the lower axis, and it shows the relationship between dredging and capping each year. Started back in the late 90s with demonstration projects. You'll see in 2011, it slowed down, and that's when we instituted a lawsuit to force the cleanup to continue at full scale, and it did. We thought we would finish last year, but weather set in early November. Hopefully that won't happen this year. So it continued into 2020. We have had challenges in 2020 with COVID, but we have been able to work together with the responsible parties, remotely oversee all of the work so we don't put any DNR staff or contractors in harm's way. Uh, folks were masked on the dredges and they got the work done. So good news so far. Surface water and sediment is responding. PCBs have been reduced by about 90% compared to measurements in 2006 in the areas from Little Lake Butamore down to the De Pere Dam. Fish are also responding. In Little Lake Butamore, where the cleanup was finished 11 years ago, we're seeing remarkable decreases in several species of fish. It's really important to look at the fish because that is the primary mode of risk to humans and wildlife is consumption of fish. So the smallmouth bass and the walleye are our indicators for human consumption and they're trending in the right direction. Restoration is also a big part of the Fox River Cleanup Project. On a parallel path, there's habitat being restored in the greater geographic area, including these examples in the Menominee Nation on the Wolf River and also Oneida Lake. Habitat replacement is happening in the Lower Fox River as well. So these slides show a habitat project that was completed just off Voyager Park. So if you're driving by and you see sticks and trees in the water, um, it's not just something Mother Nature has done. We've accelerated that by actually constructing it. It's a big, big project to construct one of these. And that's what the picture on the left is demonstrating. We have three more areas we intend to have completed yet this year or possibly into next year for more habitat like this in the Lower Fox River. The positive economic impacts reach far and wide throughout the Fox Valley. If you look at recreational sport fishing alone in the Green Bay region, there's over $260 million per year to the regional economy. A cleaner environment supports vibrant recreation and tourism. As I mentioned before, and Bree mentioned, riverfront development opportunities are expanding. And we do have robust world-class fisheries, unlike what was happening in the 70s when the cleanup started to be considered. It takes a lot of people and a lot of organizations to handle a cleanup like this and to bring it to the finish line. The top line shows the government oversight agencies. And the next line is our partners at the Bolt Company, who is a contractor to Wisconsin DNR, has been a big part of our success here. They're a local organization that has brought on the engineering expertise, statisticians, and other aspects that the governments need to properly oversee the work. The folks on the bottom are the ones that actually did the work in the river. You can access information from Wisconsin DNR's new website for the Fox River. We will update that periodically to include long-term monitoring results as they become available. There's also an EPA website and the link is provided here. And then finally, don't worry, you don't have to read this right now. I wanted to make you aware that we have a fact sheet that displays the project on a grand scale on the left-hand side is historically what was done technically. In the middle are those fast facts I mentioned earlier. And on the right-hand side talks about the future. Long-term monitoring will continue for years to come and restoration of the environment and improved recreation will also continue. 
So as we celebrate the PCB cleanup, we're also mindful of the other things we're learning about today. Working together to improve water quality that's damaged by how the land is used in urban, suburban, and rural areas. There have been a number, number of times in the last 11 years when I've had people ask me if the PCB cleanup will solve the algae problem. Uh, while it did remove some legacy phosphorus, it was designed to clean up the fish. So there's more that needs to be done. And much like the PCB project, a unified approach is vital to success. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information. And are there any questions? Great. Thank you so much. We're going to take a few minutes to um, we're going to take a few minutes to take some questions right now. Um, it looks like Beth, we do have our first question, and that just closed out my chat box. Okay. Great, and I'd just like to say thanks so much for presenting, Beth. Uh, the, I feel like this is an amazing time to live in this region, uh, to have this the PCB cleanup come to an end. It's been decades, and as a mom and married to an uh, avid fisherman, uh, this uh, particular issue really means a lot to me, and I think it's a really exciting time. Um, so with that, I think our first question here uh, is, um, what are, are, what are other possible constructive uses for the dredged material? Are any of these being looked at in Wisconsin? There's a separate project underway for looking at dredge materials from the Army Corps navigational dredging. That's not the PCB cleanup dredging per se. So all of the materials removed from the river to clean up PCBs were sent to a landfill for final disposal. So they will not be beneficially reused. But as I mentioned before, the sand is beneficially reused upland. And separately, they're looking at the ability to use sediment that comes from the Army Corps of Engineers navigation and is now in Bayport. And DNR is actively working on that with EPA and the Port Authority, Brown County. Uh, and just as a follow up, as an interesting note, can you tell some people what it has been used for, uh, the, some of the clean sed dredge sediment? So the sand um, that comes from Army Corps and the sand that came from the PCB project has been used to um, build up Cat Island. That's the clean sand that's in the outer harbor. The sand in the inner harbor and up the river was separated and tested for PCBs as part of our cleanup project and then used under highways for substrate. Also was used in landfills, both commercial landfills for cover and Georgia Pacific took quite a bit of it to their landfill locally to use as um, cover and for structural stability. So the sand is reused. Uh, the dredge material is very soft and it's mixed with polymers as part of the cleanup. So the dredge material was not reused. It also contains PCBs at relatively low levels, but it's now safely in a landfill forever. Thank you. Okay, next question. Are there time series uh, or annual event data for PCB levels in fish? Also, how does this compare to PCB levels in sediment and fish in the bay? So there are long-term monitoring reports that start back in 2010 for the upper parts of the river. And that's some of the data I presented showing 65% uh, reduction in walleye on average. For the water and sediment sampled at the same time, we're seeing a 90% reduction. So we have long-term monitoring reports uh, posted on our website for 2010, 2012, 2014, and every time there's a monitoring event in a certain segment of the river, there's a report generated by the consultants for the responsible parties. So we have all that information available and you'll be able to access that on our website or by contacting me. What we're excited about is the monitoring of fish, water, and sediment in the bay starts next year. Just like the monitoring of the last segment, seven miles of the river, you cannot start monitoring until you finish the cleanup. So the other exciting thing about finishing the cleanup is we get to start monitoring fish, water, and sediment in the mouth of the river and out in the bay. So we will do that in 2021, in 2022, and then every five years thereafter. You need three monitoring events to have statistical validity and to start looking at trends. So stay tuned and you'll hear more about the fish in the bay and the Lower Fox River as we move through the next few years. Great, thank you. Um, is the fish habitat construction part of the Fox River cleanup or is it separate project paid for by another source? There are a number of different hab habitat projects and much of that is done under the AOC program that Bree talked about. 
for the cleanup project itself, there was a requirement to replace habitat that was removed from dredging. That habitat was in the form of old pilings, or some may remember the barges and shipwrecks that were scuttled in the river years ago that were removed. Technically, those provided fish habitat, so there was a requirement to replace about five to 10 acres of habitat in the river. So that's the remaining work for habitat restoration in the river that's gonna happen hopefully this year. Great. All right, let's see. Let's see. Maybe you answered this already. Um, you mentioned monitoring will take place every five years forever on the Fox River post PCB cleanup. How will the DNR or others respond to what is found with the monitoring data, whether good or bad? So the monitoring is required in all segments of the liver for, river for fish, water, and sediment. There's a separate monitoring program for the engineered caps, and they run on a similar schedule, but on parallel paths. So what we will do with fish, water, and sediment is when they recover to the level of project goals, certain fish won't have to be monitored anymore. And the goal is within 10 to 30 years, the fish are clean enough to not have to continue monitoring fish, water, and sediment, but we won't know for perhaps 30 years. Meanwhile, we'll continue to monitor the caps in perpetuity. If there's ever a detection of PCBs that's being uh, released around those caps, we will address that with the responsible parties and use engineering practices to fix those caps and repair them. We have examples of, for example, a bridge that's gonna be built, and we know that it's a potential to impact a cap. So we're working closely with the responsible parties in the DOT to oversee that work. And so DNR will always be on watch overseeing the work and making sure that the monitoring gets done until the system responds and that the caps are always monitored. Great. Um, all right, Erin, I'm not seeing any other related questions. Um, there was, maybe Bree, you can type it in the question box. There was a, it says, great job. You mentioned, this is for Bree. You mentioned that for every $1 invested through GLRI, we see roughly X dollars returned. What was that amount again? Yeah, sure. So um, it's $3.35 or $3 on average. Um, and I added um, to that question um, just a link from that study. Um, so I can put that. Um, I guess in the broader chat box if people are interested in um, learning more about that particular study. Great. All right. And I think we have time for one more question for Beth. Um, have fish consumption advisories been modified in response to lower PCB levels in the upper river? All right. I just started typing in the answer, so I'll report on that live. So we have our fish consumption advisory program that runs in parallel. They look at the data produced by the PCB cleanup project responsible parties and also DNR collects separate data. So they will be reviewed and it's possible those consumption advisories may be modified uh, with respect to PCBs. The problem with some of the fish here is we have other issues like PFAS and mercury and other things that were not addressed by the PCB project. So while we have not seen a change in fish consumption advisories yet, uh, we'll be looking at that closely as part of DNR's separate program. And we will have to look at specifically, you know, where it's going with PCBs and the other contaminants. So what we're measuring is the PCB reductions and they're really significant, heading in the right direction for the fish. Great, all right. Thank you so much, Beth, for joining us this morning. Um, her contact information, again, is available on your, in your agenda packet. And so I'm sure you can feel free to uh, follow up with her then. All right, we are going to, thank you. <laughs> We're going to move on to our next panel. This is a panel discussion um, and presentations about the challenges that we are facing with agricultural runoff uh, in the Lower Fox River watershed and into the Bay of Green Bay. Um, so uh, we have three panel speakers. We will go through all of their presentations and then have um, a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so again, keep those questions rolling and we will start asking them uh, later. Okay, so our first speaker is Sarah Bartlett. And so Sarah, this is your time to, there we go. All right, 
Um, Sarah Bartlett is a freshwater scientist at Newwater, where she oversees Newwater's aquatic monitoring program, one of the longest monitoring programs within the Great Lakes. As captain of the Bay Guardian, Newwater's 40-foot research vessel, much of her work focuses on monitoring water quality, specifically with cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins in the Bay of Green Bay. When she's not in the on the water or in the lab, you can find Sarah on Twitter promoting science communication and Green Bay water quality. So thank you, Sarah, and welcome. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about water quality in Green Bay, and I further appreciate when that can coincide that lime green pea soup scum on the surface. Um, so just to get everyone on the same path and a little bit of background for Green Bay water quality, uh, Lower Green Bay is fed by the Fox River Lake Winnebago system. So the water that is in Lake Winnebago travels north to the Fox River and then is deposited into Lower Green Bay. So things that are on the land and kind of run off, those will all end up coming to Green Bay in the form of a runoff event. Um, that is when you have some precipitation, a lot of precipitation that causes things that should stay on the land like sediment and nutrients and puts them in the waterways where again, because of the way the, the water system is, it deposits in Lower Green Bay, creating nutrient rich conditions. And you can see these visibly during the spring, that's very common. Um, and maybe you'll be driving over the Fox River and you'll be like, holy cow, the river's really brown today. And, and that's because we have a runoff event. And just know that all of that then deposits into Lower Green Bay, creating a lot of nutrients. And these nutrients, while they are good for some things, they, you know, nutrients help things grow. In the case of Green Bay, it also, along with some other factors, will help fuel cyanobacterial blooms. And that's that picture on the right. That's your pea soup. You, you probably see this a lot. Um, cyanobacteria has a long history in Green Bay. I'm coming to you from New Water, and I always appreciate uh, the an opportunity to talk about New Water's aquatic monitoring program. We are wrapping up the 34th year of it, and what's pretty incredible is that New Water is a sewage district, and so a sewage district has one of the longest monitoring programs in the Great Lakes. So it always makes me very proud. And it's because of our monitoring program that I'm able to talk about long and short term trends in uh, Lower Green Bay and Fox River water quality. So the graph or the map on the left is color coded. And that is going to show, it just kind of shows the sampling locations that we regularly monitor with the aquatic monitoring program. The sites that are blue are going to be very nutrient rich. And then as you move north, there are more orange sites that you're kind of getting some improved water quality. And then the red sites what kind of puts us closer to Little Sturgeon Bay if you're if you like geography, um, those sites are going to definitely have some improved water quality, not as high of nutrients. And um, so that just kind of gives the, so you can kind of get an idea for when we say that the nutrients settle out in Green Bay, they really do stick to a lower portion of the bay. And I want to focus on two nutrients um, for today, phosphorus and total suspended solids. So phosphorus is um, something that we have been monitoring for the last 34 years. And if you look at the blue sites, so the, the blue lines, this graph right here is looking at an average. So we take a lot of different samples, weekly samples for a couple months straight. And then if we compare it down to one value, what represents the year, that is what is shown on the graph. And so the blue sites are your nutrient rich sites. And as you can see for the last couple decades, they have definitely been over that dashed line. That dashed red line represents what we would like to see for a water quality standard. In the case for total phosphorus, if we can get below that 0 0.1 milligram per liter, that is great. We have definitely had some improved water quality. And if you look at the last five years, uh, those blue sites, those nutrient rich sites, we are definitely have had some times where 
the average phosphorus value was indeed below that 0.1, that water quality standard. And that is definitely due to just this collaborative effort in Green Bay to work on work in the watershed, to the dredging, as, as Beth mentioned, you know, kind of removing some of that legacy phosphorus. All of those things are going to improve the water quality. And so that's just really great. And I'm always excited to look at the previous five years, knowing that there's a lot of ongoing efforts right now, and I'm very hopeful for the next five years. If we look at total suspended solids, and suspended solids are going to be, they can be in the form of soil and sediment, and they can also be things like blue-green algae. Those are um, going to be kind of these little particles that are suspended in the water. So again, your blue site, your blue dots right here are gonna be from the nutrient areas. And if you look at the last five years, we are getting closer to having all colors, all sites be below that dash line. So coming within water, having improved water quality standards. I'm always hopeful for this one as well, knowing um, all the great efforts that are ongoing. So even though we are having improved water quality with regards to phosphorus and total suspended solids, we still are seeing a lot of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is a naturally occurring bacteria. It is commonly referred to blue-green algae, and it can be problematic for water quality issues. This image right here is probably images that we may have all seen if we are recreating um, or kind of near some shorelines during the summer months. You have this pea soup scum on the surface of the water, and it's problematic for water quality because it is very unsightly. It can also be um, produce some odors, especially when this material, this blue-green algae starts to degrade. You get a lot of odors from the start of the decomposition process. And then the cyanobacteria will sink into the water and settle out on the bottom of the lake bed. And then as it's being decomposed, it really utilizes and takes up a lot of oxygen and really depleting an area of oxygen that other tinier organisms really rely on. Cyanobacteria are also problematic because they can produce toxins or cyanotoxins that can be harmful to humans and animals, um, particularly if you ingest them. So there's a lot of talk about possibly cyanobacteria blooms increasing in intensity or occurrence, but I just want to point out that this problem of cyanobacteria is not new unique to Green Bay. It is a nationwide problem. It is a worldwide problem. They are some of the oldest organisms in the world. So if you're looking for a reason or um, kind of a solution to remove cyanobacteria from your water body, good luck. It's They were here first. So instead, what we need to do is focus on things that might help not fuel them, give, take away their energy source to grow, and then hopefully we can kind of keep these cyanobacteria blooms in check. Um, so we don't actually know if blooms are increasing or not. It might just be actually that people's overall knowledge of what blue-green algae is, what that pea soup surface scum is. I think maybe it's more that that is increasing, but regardless, it's helping us kind of learn a little bit more about what they are and what we can do to kind of help, we, um, help us kind of safely enjoy our water bodies. So as I mentioned, cyanobacteria can produce cyanotoxins. And right now, um, if you were to measure cyanotoxins, their commercial technology is not available to measure them in real time. Meaning that if I go to a water body and I take a water sample, there is not a way for me to get an immediate result back for how many toxins are in the water. Not only that, but cyanobacteria can produce something like 250 known compounds of different varieties of cyanotoxins. So there's not a universal method to measure all of these either. What we do have are methods that can provide us results within hours to days. They're very expensive. And not only that, but the act of Collecting a water sample and analyzing it is very labor intensive and it's not frequent enough to capture the dynamics that might be occurring. So if you take a water sample in the morning, as we know, if you've been on any water body, you've got waves, you have wind, you have a lot of mixing going on. And so the sample from the morning might not represent what's happening in that afternoon. However, there's currently um, a, a large project here in Lower Green Bay, a multi-agency effort that started in 2016 and it's ending this year to help us understand maybe what is, um, what is 
triggering or occurring that the cyanobacteria are producing these toxins. And we hope that we can um, have some tools available that might help us better uh, understand what is causing toxins in the water and maybe if there's days that we can quickly know should we be concerned or not. However, we always encourage that when the water is green, you know, when in doubt, stay out. And I just, I want to recognize the project partners. Their logos are listed at the bottom of the screen. It's been a huge effort, um, kind of the first effort of its kind in Green Bay to really understand where are the blooms happening in Green Bay and what kind of toxins are we seeing. For the future, as I, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. We have some really exciting products that are coming online to help us monitor for harmful algal blooms. This includes using satellites. Uh, New Water is currently partnering with NASA to um, deploy equipment that helps kind of ground truth what the satellites are seeing. And this is great because satellites can see a lot of area at once. We know it's very expensive to monitor for water bodies. Um, and so if we can look at a satellite and look and see that, oh wow, there's a lot of lakes that are green right now, that's just really gonna help us in the future. We also have buoys. This image on the right is a water quality monitoring buoy and that has different parameters on there that we might be able to use to kind of say like when we have an increase in this variable, we also see an increase in toxins, cyanotoxins or cyanobacteria. And hopefully, I hope to say in a couple of years that we will actually have some commercial real-time technology to monitor for cyanotoxins right away. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions um, at the end of the presentation. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. We're gonna move right along to our next presenter. Uh, that, so. Kevin, if you wanna, uh, okay, great. Uh, so Kevin Fermanick is a professor of water science, geoscience and environmental science at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay where he's worked since 1998. Kevin is also a soil and water sources specialist with ex Wisconsin Extension. Kevin and his students frequently collaborate with other scientists and stakeholders on water quality, watershed management, soil health, Green Bay restoration and agricultural management. Studies. Kevin recently was honored as the new Northeast Wisconsin Watershed Champion of 2020 on World Water Day for his deep commitment to working together to find solutions to complex water challenges that we face today. So welcome, um, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Julia. And thank you to the Clean Bay Backers for uh, organizing and hosting uh, this important event. Um, so I guess my challenge is to follow up here with Sarah and talk about watershed connections um, to the bay and to our receiving waters. Um, clearly, as this image uh, shows, um, this, there's a direct connection, right? We can see in the lower bay that there's a, a sediment plume coming into the bay, but we also see that in other areas along Lake Michigan, in southern Lake Winnebago, and some of the upper pool lakes as well. So what I'm going to talk about today then is some of the challenges of uh, measuring progress out on the landscape and understanding some of the impacts of climate change and uh, um, the weather that we've been having on, the, on, on our surface water bodies and so on. So as I mentioned, there is a direct connection between the landscape and the quality of our streams, rivers, lakes, and the Bay of Green Bay. And really, they're really a reflection of the landscape. Um, Sarah alluded to, obviously, and talked about harmful algal blooms, and this image here shows um, the landscape in June of, 20, uh, of 2020, and the areas that, in this case, in Lake Winnebago, that were having uh, algal blooms at the time. So what's happening on the landscape drives what happens in the water. So we have a project where we've been trying to link the watershed conditions and watershed activities and the export of the nutrients that Sarah mentioned uh, to Green Bay and how the Bay um, responds to that. So there is a direct connection. If we lower, this graphic here shows phosphorus load across the bottom and then shows the number of days of low oxygen conditions or hypoxia in Green Bay. And the baseline conditions show here in our model that about 40 plus days of low oxygen conditions might exist in the bay under, no, under our baseline load conditions. And as we reduce the load, um, 
we reduce the amount of algal blooms and therefore also reduce the amount of days with low oxygen levels. So we might expect as we improve conditions on the landscape, reduce the amount of nutrients from leaving the landscape, that we will see improvements in algal blooms, oxygen levels, clarity, and so on in our receiving waters, including Green Bay. Um, so we might, when, when we try to understand levels of progress and measure progress, we have to think about what factors influence the, uh, the export of phosphorus and so on. So this graphic here shows that you know, precipitation is critical, uh, particularly the amount, timing, and intensity. And as many of you know, 2018 and 2019 were record precipitation years that have created real challenges in our agricultural working landscapes. Um, and of course, land cover and nutrient content are other key factors. We can use all these factors together to estimate how much is running off the landscape and what areas are contributing the most. Um, this graphic here, some of you may have seen before, right, shows areas within the watershed that have the greatest export of phosphorus and areas that have less export of phosphorus. And this is the export as delivered all the way to Green Bay. So we have many areas, particularly in the lower Fox River, that have the highest um, losses or export of phosphorus, in many cases over two pounds per acre per year being lost. And therefore the areas in the lower Fox and areas around Lake Winnebago are really the ones that are getting much of the attention for reducing the nutrient loading going into um, our rivers and streams and then ultimately into Green Bay. And the conditions and, and the management practices on the uh, landscape in these locations are really critical to how much is lost. Our goals really are to get this down to less than two and, and closer to one across the landscape in many cases. Um, this graphic here uh, shows that you know, if we want to, to manage our uh, nutrients and the nutrient sources and the nutrient losses, we have to be able to um, measure those. So we can't manage what we don't measure. And that me the measurements are being done by a, uh, uh, lots of different partners from the edge of field to stream scale to the Fox River scale to the bay, some of what you heard from Sarah. The uh, Fox River or the edge of field scale is getting at this is shown on the left side of these pictures. All, many of these sites are run by the US Geological Survey. River sites such as Plum and uh, East River and, and uh, Ashwaubenon Creek are being measured at the stream level to look at export what's happening on the landscape. Should also say there's also tile drainage being monitored by the Discovery Farms. And this lower, the picture on the lower right is West Plum Creek in 2014. That shows you an example of measuring stream outflow. And you can see in this case, it was quite uh, muddy. So the monitoring gives us a, a sense of how this, the landscape is changing and what times of the year are the worst years for export and how much is leaving the landscape, a really important question. So, if we zoom in here to the edge of field, this is a picture from one of the Lower Fox River demonstration farm farmers. And what you see here is a monitoring station that is measuring the runoff from a farm field, an active farm field, and also through the surface as well as through the tile drainage. And so these farmers want to know how much is being lost from their landscape and how do the practices that they do in this field will change the amount of losses. This is a picture you can see is from earlier this month. Um, and it's a very different year this year with respect to corn harvest. It happened much earlier than last year. And therefore, it will allow the farmers to put in uh, cover crops much earlier and probably have more success in putting in cover crops to reduce their uh, losses. Um, at this scale, we really want to detect you know, change on the ground. So when a farmer changes practices, changes manure applications, do we see those changes in the water? And uh, what are really, and also what are the current conditions? Um, under intensive agriculture with dairy, we might lose six pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. In other conditions, we might have less than one pound. And we need to keep moving towards that area of less than two pounds per acre per year. And I have on here that manure is really a critical piece. Uh, how manure is managed is critical to what we're seeing in the edge of field sites. Um, if we look at the, um, what's happening in the stream, this graphic shows some of the impacts of those very wet years. This is the total runoff from Plum Creek. And um, the green area is the middle of the, uh, sort of, the, of the nine years of data. And then you can see where 2019 was the highest 
modern runoff and particularly March of 2019 where it increased the most. And then fall of 19 into 2020 was also a pretty high year except for this last part of uh, the 2020 where it's been relatively low runoff amounts. So these um, events, you can think of they create, or these years make challenge for what we can understand and whether we're making progress in our streams. Here shows the West Plum Station now in March of 2019, and you can see that what was happening on the landscape here can have a big impact on the export. So you're talking about the export here, um, this graphic shows the monthly loads at Plum Creek with a highlight of the April months, just so you can see. The main point I want to say here is that it's dynamic um, and that we are not particularly seeing improvements at the watershed scale in many of our watersheds at this point. It's a uh, variable and these years of high rainfall make it very challenging to measure progress. And one of the challenges that we face going forward is that we see evidence of increased um, precipitation, particularly um, large storm events as shown here. This is for the upper Midwest. And the prediction is that this changing climate as we move forward that we will have more days with greater than two inch precipitation in our area. This is in the past and then the prediction for the future, projections for the future show that the number of days per decade with greater than two inches would double in many parts of Wisconsin, including our area. So that creates the challenge. So how might we meet that challenge? Um, we can see that, um, and this, this graphic here shows the amount of land cover um, and how well the land is protected from uh, satellite, Im satellite imagery in Apple Creek. And I'm gonna click through to my next slide here. And this, this graphic here shows the number of cropland acres that are protected over on the right versus unprotected. And we are seeing some progress, 2014, the number of acres versus 2018. And I see that my time is about up. So I'm gonna just end with this slide that as we move towards the talking about the Lower Fox demonstration farms, that we need to continue to work to have make a more resilient landscape, watch how we manage the manure, and also restore some of the hydrologic function within the system. And I'll end at that point. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, moving on, we are going to do our last speaker in this panel, Whitney Presby. Uh, Whitney Presby works as a natural resource educator with the Fox Demo Farms Project, a collaborative effort designed to identify and implement conservation practices that reduce phosphorus and sediment loading into the Fox River and the Bay of Green Bay. She uses innovative social science strategies to engage with farmers and communicate the positive changes happening throughout the watershed. Through her work, Whitney creates opportunities for people to learn from each other and develop lasting solutions to better benefit our shared water resources. So welcome, Whitney, and thank you. Hey, thanks, Julia. And thank you, Clean Bay Backers, for putting on this great event today. So I'm gonna be talking about the Fox Demo Farms Project, which began in 2014. It is a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funded project. So GLRI funding, which we've been hearing a lot about today and you will continue to hear from me today because it has had such an impact on our watershed and has added so much value to the farmers in our area. As you can see, there are a number of partners involved in the project. The partners have contributed staff time, they've contributed financial resources, and in some cases, both. And then of course, the farmers are, um, we, we couldn't have done it without the farmers. They have been tremendous leaders in our watershed. So a huge thank you goes out to all the work that they have been doing over the last six years. So when the project started, we had four original farms. We uh, asked that they take 200 acres and adopt conservation practices on those 200 acres. We asked that they open up their farm for field days and other outreach activities and essentially serve as a learning hub for how to adopt these practices in Northeast Wisconsin. Something that's important to remember is that we were asking these farms to do something that was completely different from what they had been doing for generations. These practices, um, in most cases, was a complete overhaul of their entire operation. So it was a really big ask and the farmers met that ask and have gone well beyond what we could have ever imagined. We have a couple of farmers that are at 100% conservation practices on their farm, several that are getting close to that point. 
Um, we are at eight farms that are in the demo farm network. Um, in 2020, though, we did add what we are calling phase two farms. So we brought in another agronomist with Brown County. And then we are working with five additional farms who are kind of what we call the next level of adopters. So they're just getting started with these practices, but they're really eager to, to make a difference on their landscape. And then in addition, uh, the demo farm network concept has been moving throughout the whole um, eastern half of Wisconsin. So we now have five demo farm networks in eastern Wisconsin and looking to add a six later this fall. So it's really great to see this concept taking off um, in the Great Lakes region. So what are we asking the farmers to do? So both Kevin and Sarah did an excellent overview of the water quality issues. Um, that we're facing here in the Lower Fox and um, the Bay of Green Bay. But I'm going to be talking about what we're actually asking the farmers to do and the changes that we're asking them to make on the landscape. And so the first thing is minimizing the soil disturbance. So in a traditional conventional system, what we would probably see is farmers going in in the fall and in the spring and tilling that that soil over, turning it over, leaving it brown and bare going into the winter months and then again turning it over and planting right into a, a bare ground. What we're asking them to, to, to do now is to put away that tillage equipment and just use no-till systems to plant their cover crops. So believe it or not, this picture right here is a farmer who is planting their soybeans into a living cover crop. And to do this, it requires a change in equipment. So like I said, this is big structural changes that we're asking the farms to do in, on, their, um, on their operation. And so that requires some financial resources. So getting back to that GLRI funding. So not only has that GLRI funding been used to help fund our project, but it's also been used to help bring in equipment that is necessary for farmers to be able to try this. So this is a roller crimper um, out of Gamey County, uh, purchased this equipment. It's available for rent for farmers. So farmers can try this equipment out. They can see if it works in their system. If it does, they can either you know, make that decision to invest in it or they can get creative. We've seen a lot of farmers make modifications to existing equipment. We've seen them do partnerships with other farmers in their neighborhood or far, our custom applicators or custom uh, planters. So there's a lot of creative ways to make it work in their system, but they need that opportunity first to try it. And so that's why that GLRI funding is really important. And the second thing, so minimizing that soil disturbance. So we want to keep the soil intact. Um, so that when we have those heavy rains in late fall and the snow melt and rain in the spring, that soil stays in place. And so by not disturbing the soil, we, have, we give a better chance for it to stay on the, the, um, the surface and out of our waterways. The second piece is keeping the soil covered. So in addition to minimizing the, the soil disturbance, we want to make sure we're getting a cover crop out there. So I showed you in that previous picture that farmer was planting into a standing rye cover crop. This is an example of an interseeded cover crop. And so when I say cover crop, basically that is anything that's planted after your primary crop. So anything that's planted after your corn, your soybean, your winter wheat, it's basically getting something out on the ground and making sure we have a living root going into the winter months and then in, again in the spring. And so again, this here is a, an interseeded field. Interseeding is a new technology, a new system. So um, that that uh, equipment has been brought in, again, through GLRI funding as well as uh, Fund for Lake Michigan. So there are currently three interseeders available for farmers in the watershed to be able to try these practices. Um, this farmers get to go in when this corn is about six inches tall and they plant their cover crop. Uh, that cover crop gets shaded out in the summer when that corn is really tall, but it gets established and that's the really key point so that when the fall comes and they harvest that corn, it's already established. They already have a head start going into the winter and they have those, the, those living roots going in uh, to help absorb that water. So cover crops really act as kind of like a water pump pulling that water out of the system and um, instead of letting it run off and carrying nutrients into our waterways. So speaking of nutrients, um, we can't talk about agriculture in Northeast Wisconsin without talking about manure. So again, uh, this you may have guessed is another piece of equipment that's available for rent because of GLRI funding. Uh, so this is a low disturbance manure injector. And what this allows us to do um, it's really important because of two things. First of all, it um, one of the things that farmers are able to do because of the soil health, because they're building their soil structure, is they're creating opportunities or new windows for applying manure. So they're not relying on these big 
applications in late fall of maybe 20,000 gallons of manure and then having to incorporate the manure and leaving that bare going into the winter months. Instead, what they're able to do is find these windows throughout the growing season and apply multiple applications of manure in lower quantities, so maybe 8,000 gallons of manure. So one, that's really important, the smaller quantity of manure. The second thing, what this equipment allows farmers to do is to apply it to a crop. So they can either apply it to uh, potentially their main crop, or in this case, this is a cover crop that they're applying the, the manure to. And that's really important too, because that um, having a living crop taking those nutrients up right away really reduces the likelihood that those uh, nutrients are gonna end up in our waterway. So again, Farmer field days, those are really important. Getting farmers out to, the, to learn from their peers, hearing what works, what doesn't work, and then hearing from uh, experts like Jamie Patton here uh, from UW, a soil scientist, talking about uh, these practices and improving soil health. Community engagement. So Brickstead Dairy has been a, a tremendous partner in Sunset on the Farm, getting the community out to learn about these practices, learn about what farmers are doing to improve our water quality has been a really key, key component of our outreach strategy, that community engagement. Um, over the last few years, we've had a thousand people out to see Dan's farm, which is awesome. And then we have these field signs. So we have a cover crops and no-till for clean water signs. So if a farmer's using these practices in the watershed, they can put a sign out to let their neighbors know what they're doing. And lastly, I just want to show this map because we have about 70 signs out in the watershed right now and only about 20 of those signs are actually on fields that are owned and operated by Fox Dumbo Farms. So these practices are starting to spread and that's really great to see. So with that, I will open it up. I think we have our questions. Awesome. Whitney, thank you so much. Um, I invite um, all of our panels uh, to now Let's see, to now put on your, our panel members to put on your video, please, your videos. Um, I would just like to also thank all three of you. This was a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I'll just do a big clap for all of you. Um, appreciate that you're squeezing this in. So um, let's see, I'm gonna have to chat box. <clears throat> Why is it not, where did it go? Okay, um, our first question is for Sarah. Um, there are some questions about um, what, uh, what caused the change in phosphorus and nutrient runoff levels uh, between 2007 to 2009 for phosphorus levels. I want to say, oh, I'm so glad that you, you pointed that out. That is going to be something that, that is a question that plagues uh, myself and others, I know Kevin and I, we, uh, you know, I hate to say we don't know, but I think it's important to say we're not sure. Um, also, the, those values are measured before my time at New Water, and so just kind of going back and looking at things that might have happened um, is still kind of something that we are actively doing, and um, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that I cannot answer the first question other than to tell you we're, we're looking into kind of things that might have happened that caused that those peaks in phosphorus. Okay, great. Um, how about another question? Um, someone says, I live on the bay. Is it safe to recreate, for example, swim, paddleboard, kayak in the river in the bay? I think there's always some water quality or recreational things that you should be aware of in any type of urban water body. Um, using the philosophy that the um, Department of Health Services kind of, and the Wisconsin DNR, we all, that when in doubt, stay out. So if you are seeing that pea, lime, soup color surface on the water, definitely don't recreate in that. Um, one thing that I didn't get into that is a little bit um, deeper is that usually um, we can assume that when the water is green that there might be some there might be a chance that the blooms are producing toxins however there's also a chance maybe in the absence of a bloom or following that when it starts to de decay and go away there might also be some toxins in the water as well and I know that that's not a very comforting thing um, so maybe think of it as if you were to 
you know, after a rain event, you, you typically don't swim after the rain because you can see that a lot has been turned up. So just keep that in mind, you know, the water's green, stay out. If you, if you have a pet, definitely don't let that pet anywhere near the water during a bloom. Um, they tend to ingest anything. And so just keeping that in mind, there's a lot of great resources that the Department of Health Services has put together. Um, always, you know, if you recreate, if you want to recreate, go for it. Um, just keep in mind that um, smaller children and pets, they don't always um, handle um, recreational um, problems as well as kind of adults who are a little bit hardier. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, all right, so just a clarification question maybe for Kevin. Um, it looks like someone asked, uh, there are a lot of creeks um, and uh, a lot of other rivers and streams that enter into the bay, for example, Swamico, Little Swamico, Duck, Peshtigo, Menominee rivers. The fox is important, but is anyone else studying sediment nutrient pollution from these other systems? Sure. So, you know, the, the bay or the, the Fox River and, and Duck Creek um, contribute typically more than two thirds of the total load to the entire Green Bay system, particularly for phosphorus and sediment. Um, and as far as the other streams, I think the Menominee River is the only other one that uh, USGS routinely has uh, continuous monitoring on that we would know the loads. Um, we do include all of those watersheds in our bay models for understanding the loads coming from those um, watersheds, but unfortunately, I'm not aware of much being done as far as continuous monitoring or specific studies on some of those other uh, contributing tributaries on that side of the bay. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And we got a lot of questions coming in, so we'll keep going. Um, this is for anybody. How much difference or potential for difference do you see in the conservation agricultural movement in Brown County and the surrounding counties? Whitney, you wanna? Yeah, I guess I could um, start off with Kevin, you can add to that. Um, I would say, I think from where we started six years ago, um, when the Demo Farms project started, I know this was before I started, before I was with the project, but um, it was kind of a shot in the dark of which farmers were we gonna work with and not a lot was happening with cover crops and no-till in the area. What we've seen in the last six years has just been a night and day difference. Um, farmers are, are really taking a grasp on these practices. They're seeing it work. They're seeing, um, you know, not only the financial um, impact that it's having and the soil health improvements that farmers are experiencing who have been doing these practices for a while, um, so I, I'm very optimistic that these, pra these practices are gonna to continue to grow. That's not to say that we don't have a lot of work still ahead of us. There's still um, a lot of tillage going on out in the watershed. Um, but I think these practices are, the farmers themselves are seeing it work on their neighbor's fields and that peer-to-peer -peer learning has really been effective and um, moving that needle, I think is, we, we're seeing a, a difference. Great. So as a follow-up question, and I love that someone submitted this because this is um, an event for elected officials and community leaders. So uh, the question is, any thoughts on policy, like incentives for farmers to maintain a healthy cover to ensure nutrients and sediments stay on the land? And any of you can take that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Um, you know, there are definitely, and I don't know, Sarah, if you'd want to talk about New Water's involvement with their adaptive management project and the, the innovative way of working with farmers um, to meet permitting requirements. I think that's a, um, a new approach that I think if other entities are able to uh, adopt that um, outlook on their permitting requirements, I think that's very interesting. I also think there's, you know, there's always, there's been talk about you know, cover crops and climate change and how farmers are going to be part of the solution as far as um, carbon sequestering and using cover crops as that tool to keep the carbon in the ground and um, using no-till practices. What that really looks like, I don't know <laughs> from a, a policy standpoint, but I think um, the fact that those conversations are being had is really important. I think um, involving farmers in that conversation is going to be critical. Um, I know that sometimes that's a topic that people assume farmers don't want to have a conversation with, but I think we're seeing, especially, you know, the last two years when we had those significant rainfall events, 
um, they're seeing the impacts and I don't think that it's a topic that we should be avoiding um, with sure. this audience. So. Does anyone else have maybe another answer to address the policy, if there's policy type um, um, ideas for our elected officials on the call today? Well, um, I think, I, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, you know, not necessarily policy, but anytime we can continue to lobby for more funds for the Great Lakes, um, specifically in Green Bay, I'll just speak from a HAPS perspective, um, or cyanobacteria, we see a lot of funding go towards Lake Erie, and in Green Bay, we are experiencing harmful algal blooms as well, so I would, I'm always trying to advocate for more funding for our area. And Kevin, did you want to say anything about in, in policy incentives for farmers? Well, I think the there's been some good evidence that doing uh, things that are pay for performance ones where we actually measure the improvements out on the landscape and uh, that that can incentivize um, the activities. And I think we also need to be keep thinking about policies that can reduce our soil phosphorus levels and incentivize that um, so that we match the nutrient capacity of the landscape to the supply of the nutrients. Great, thank you. Um, I'll say that, you know, if, if folks on the call are interested, you know, we can always get a hold of um, these folks for more, uh, more focused discussions after, after this event. So I encourage you to do so. That has happened in the past. Um, uh, so just maybe one more question. Erin, I don't know out of all these questions, which one I should be asking. Um, there are a lot of great questions on here. Uh, how about, um, uh, Aaron, do you have a favorite that you want me to put in, ask? Uh, how about uh, for Sarah, what explains that precipitation runoff in the recent years was the highest ever recorded for Wisconsin. So it was the, some of our wettest years on record. Yet new water monitoring shows that phosphorus and sediment levels were lower in the last five years than previous decades. That's a great question. Thank you. I think that we can attribute this to really the collaborative effort that is happening on the landscape, trying to make sure that nutrients and sediment stay on the land. Whitney and Kevin gave great examples for a lot of the work that is happening to kind of uh, slow down the, the flow of water during those rain events. Um, cover crops definitely help keep soil on the soil. And I also think that, um, you know, secondary to that, going along with what Beth said with the dredging, we also saw that dredging occurred uh, the last most recent years um, it, at the mouth of the Fox River and maybe re the removal of some legacy phosphorus is also contributing to those low phosphorus values. So it's a twofold here. It's a lot of really great collaborative efforts in the watershed along with um, that PCB dredging probably helped as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much to our three panelists and we will try to answer your questions continuously as this event continues forward and encourage you to reach out to them after the event also. Okay, so moving on to our final panel. Uh, this is a panel about emerging uh, water quality issues that are happening uh, and we have some a special panel to deal with PFAS and then also with plastic. So our first speaker on the panel is Megan Williams. Hello. Uh, Megan Williams is an environmental toxicologist at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Her work involves assessing the risks of exposure to harmful substances and developing surface water criteria for the protection of human health and aquatic life. So welcome, Megan. Hi. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. That's great, you're right. on. Okay, so today I am gonna talk about um, 
a group of compounds that are known as PFAS, which stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances um, in our surface water. So I'm gonna give you some background and then I'm gonna talk about um, our effort to um, reduce your exposure to them um, in the form of surface water quality criteria. So PFAS are actually a family of over 4,000 compounds that are made by humans. So they don't occur naturally in the environment. And they have a really unique chemical structure, um, which gives them some really useful properties. So they're really strong. This um, carbon fluorine bond is really strong, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, but they also have these really unique um, oil and water repelling properties. So they've been manufactured since the 1940s um, for a variety of uses. Um, historically, they were used for nonstick and protective coatings like on cookware. Um, they're also used to make waterproof fabrics, so fabrics that you would use when you're camping or doing outdoor activities. Um, another thing that they've been used for is firefighting foams. Um, they are really good at starving fires of oxygen, and so they're used at airports or on military installations where you'd want to put out a fire really fast. Um, they've also been used to um, create stain and water resistant products that you apply to something else. Um, they're used in the chrome plating process, um, in food packaging to prevent grease from getting from the inside to the outside of a um, package and then in some personal care products. So they've been used in a lot of different ways, um, but they, because of this really strong bond, they're really hard to break down. And additionally, some types of PFAS can build up in fish and animal tissue. So what that means is there can be a really small amount of this type of PFAS in the water column, but it really builds up to high concentrations in fish and animal tissue. Um, as a result of them being so um, difficult to break down, they've been found almost everywhere across the world that they've been looked for. And they can cause some negative health effects in animals and humans. So while they do have useful properties, um, there are also quite a lot of negative effects as well. And so we're trying to um, reduce everyone's exposure to these um, compounds. So there are some ways that you yourself can reduce PFAS exposure when you're recreating, um, which is, this is gonna sound really similar to some of the things that you heard from the HABs. Um, so first, we don't wanna ingest untreated surface water. Um, there are a lot of things in surface water that can make you sick, so um, PFAS is just one, one concern. Um, and don't touch foams they, that occur on water bodies or allow your pets or children to play in them. When you're done recreating, make sure you wash your hands, make sure you wash off your pets, wash your children's hands. Um, and then finally, if you're gonna be fishing, make sure to follow your fish consumption advisories because they really are designed to help you get all the benefits from eating fish, but minimizing your risk. Um, DNR is also working to reduce your PFAS exposure through surface water quality criteria. Um, and water quality criteria is basically the maximum amount of a substance that will protect you from negative effects of either contact with or ingestion of surface water um, or ingestion of fish from surface water. So um, this next slide is just a uh, sort of overview of how we calculate our human health criteria. We have this acceptable daily exposure value, um, a body weight constant, a relative source contribution, um, which takes into account how much you would get from um, surface water versus other areas, um, a fish consumption rate and a bioaccumulation factor, and a drinking water intake rate. And many of these are specified in code but some of these um, are things that we are um, responsible for developing as part of DHS or DNR. Um, and so we have this rulemaking timeline that is for creating our surface water quality criteria. Um, I'm gonna kind of click through this very quickly. Um, I want to highlight that right now in the 2020 all year, we're drafting the rule and we're doing um, advisory group meetings. So our next meeting is on um, October 9th. 
Um, and if all goes as planned, which, you know, who knows what will happen, um, the rule would become effective in the summer of 2020. Um, so I have some opportunities for you to get more information. I think this is also in the chat. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time here on this. Um, so so uh, that is everything I have to say. And um, I just want to say thanks for giving me the opportunity. And feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, and I am sorry, I don't know why I didn't touch anything on my computer. So I have no idea what, <laughs> what Zoom just did no in terms deal. of recording or not recording. Uh, OK, <laughs> so hopefully that worked. <laughs> Who knows? OK, great. Thank you. So I want to welcome um, No, our next speaker is Sarah Bogoyan. Uh, Kelly, not quite. Uh, there we go. And Cal, um, Meg, or Sarah, if you want to bring up your and share your screen and get yourself unmuted, that would be great while I introduce you a little bit. Uh, Sarah Balboyan is a UWC grant and U, uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources J. Philip Keeler Water Science Fellow um, at UW-Madison. Sarah is researching, uh, her research is focused on PFAS contamination in the Bay of Green Bay. So. And we cannot see your video yet. Um, it says that it's unable, the host is unable to start the video. But I can go ahead and start if. Um, yeah, I don't know. It says um, unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Um, but I'll just go ahead and start talking. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to give a quick overview on a project we're doing at UW-Madison um, with funding from uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant on the sources of PFAS in the Bay of Green Bay. Here we go. Um, and so I want to start off by saying that the PFAS levels in the Green Bay um, are not concerning as of now, um, but rather this project is to um, is designed to understand the contributions of PFAS um, to the Great Lakes. Um, so when you look at the research that has been done on PFAS in the Great Lakes, um, you see that Lake Michigan, including the Bay of Green Bay, um, are understudied. So our goal of this project is to fill in those gaps. Um, so from Megan's presentation, we know that um, PFAS are extremely stable in the environment. They are hazardous to human health and they're ubiquitous. So scientists find them basically everywhere they look for them. Um, and yet we're still using them in a wide variety of applications. One example is firefighting foams. Um, so these aren't your average firefighting products. They're a military grade foam um, that's used to put out liquid fuel fires. So they're used at places like airports, um, military sites, um, and oil refineries. And the reason why they're still being used is because they're really good at putting out fuel fires. And so there is a facility in the northeast corner of uh, Wisconsin called the Tyco Fire Technology Center in Marinette. Um, and this facility manufactures these firefighting foams. And after years of on-site trainings um, and accidental spills and other kinds of environmental releases, there is extensive PFAS uh, contamination in the groundwater um, in the surrounding areas. Um, and so PFAS can move pretty readily in the environment. And so the proximity of this facility um, to the Bay of Green Bay and to these rivers that lead into the Green Bay suggests that this PFAS is making its way into the Bay. Um, and that leads us to the idea that the Bay of Green Bay may be somewhat of a, hot, a PFAS hotspot um, within Lake Michigan. 
So what we have been doing is collecting and analyzing water samples and sediment samples from um, tributaries that are leading to the Bay of Green Bay. And what we hope to get out of this is uh, somewhat of a spatial distribution of um, PFAS contributions to the bay. And we do expect to see that most of the PFAS will be concentrated around the Tyco facility, um, which is the blue star on this map. Um, but there are some other possibilities as well, like the industrial area around the city of Green Bay um, and a couple of smaller airports. So along with identifying where the PFAS is coming from, we also want to identify how it's moving in the environment. PFAS is kind of unique in that it uh, is easily transported by moving water, but it also tends to accumulate in things like sediment, um, so like uh, river bed sediment, um, in biota such as fish, and then in foam, which can form on the surface of water bodies under the right conditions. So we are focusing on the riverbed sediment um, and, and researching ways that this can affect the transport of PFAS, specifically in these Green Bay tributaries. Um, so that is all from me. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, if you have any questions for me, my email is shown here. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, and we're getting some questions coming in, which is great to see as we switch over to our last presentation, and then we will have our Q final Q&A panel. Um, so, Kelly, if you wanna get, start your video, start sharing your screen, and unmute yourself. Kelly Ryer is an outreach coordinator with the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. Kelly works to spread awareness about watershed health and impacts to surface water from stormwater runoff throughout the basin. She coordinates the annual Fox Wolf Watershed Cleanup, the Wolf, Fox Wolf's largest volunteer event, and she often goes into schools around the watershed too to work with kids on these important uh, water quality issues. So uh, Kelly, um, if you want, we, I cannot see, do you have also a video, sh video sharing issue? Um, I don't think so, I see myself. Great, we can see you, so take it away. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so I am going to talk about plastic pollution and our waters, and I have quite a few slides um, because I'm really enthusiastic about this topic. So I'm gonna try to get started right away. How do I do that? Okay, there we go, okay. Um, so the first slide I have on here um, is about marine debris. So a lot of times when we hear about um, plastic or garbage pollution in our waterways, we're hearing about the ocean, we're hearing about the garbage patches. So I wanted to start there. Um, and according to NOAA, about 80% of marine debris is plastic. Um, I don't know what that percentage is for our local lakes and rivers, but I would assume based on what I've seen being out there cleaning up is that it's fairly close. Um, and then they also, NOAA also indicated the most common types of plastic that are cleaned up, uh, which includes um, cigarette butts, beverage bottles, plastic caps, food wrappers, and straws. And a lot of people don't realize that cigarette butts are um, a type of plastic called cellulose acetate. Um, so uh, we find the same things, and by we, I mean myself and the volunteers who go out and do cleanups, we find the same um, types of plastic out there. I would also add um, plastic bags to that list as well. Um, and then it's also important to note the different ways that this garbage is getting into our waterways, which includes rain, wind, littering, storm drains, and tributaries. Um, so bringing it closer to home, um, I have some more local photos of plastic pollution. Um, so this big photo on the left was recently shared with the Clean Bay backers um, from a resident who lives on the lower end of the bay on East Shore Drive. So all of the plastic that you see in that photo, which is alarming, um, washed up over this past winter and spring um, on her property. And then I also added a few um, photos from our cleanup events. So the picture of the volunteers standing by um, the Alloway Kay Kayakers Point sign, all that garbage in that picture was from just one section of the Fox River Trail from Fox Point Boat Launch down to Kayakers Point. So that's, that's a significant amount. 
and then I just added another photo of a volunteer who was cleaning up at Voyager Park in De Pere, and then this picture of balloons, that picture is from a park in Green Bay. So I'm going to first talk about the issues associated with plastic pollution, and then I'm going to move on to the more positive part about what we can do to tackle this issue. Um, so longevity is obviously um, a big concern with our plastic pollution. Um, it, you can see from this infographic that on average, a plastic straw that you know, we might use for a couple of minutes in our waterways can take up to 200 years to degrade. Um, and you can look at some of the other um, examples here, including plastic bags up to 20 years. Um, cigarette butts, which aren't on here, can take up to 10 years to degrade in our waterways. And what's important to understand with this degradation is that um, what this means is when they break down, they're generally just breaking into smaller pieces. Um, and those that do completely break down degrade into polymers and toxic chemicals. So they're not breaking down into anything positive for sure. Um, microplastics has been a big um, topic lately in the news. So microplastics are generally just pieces of plastic that are five millimeters or smaller. Um, there are a few different sources of microplastics. Um, previously, we had a lot of them coming from cosmetic products, including face scrubs and toothpaste. Um, but another source of these microplastics is just the plastic in, in our waterways breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so, and this actually, even though this is an emerging issue where I, my subject, um, I recently read that microplastics were discovered in the 1970s. Um, so quite a while already that we've known about them. Um, within the past decade or so, they've been confirmed in the Great Lakes. And then um, I added this image of um, the US Today Network um, showing that researchers did find my microplastics in the Winnebago system as well. Um, and then the problem with microplastics is that a lot of wildlife will um, mistake them as a food source. Um, and they're also, they've also been shown to absorb environmental toxins um, as well. So impacts to wildlife. Uh, all this plastic garbage definitely impacts wildlife. So the picture on the left um, shows a local volunteer who was doing a cleanup in Menasha, Wisconsin. They found this crayfish entangled in fishing, fishing line or monofilament. Um, the good news, I guess, with this little crayfish is that they were able to set him free and hopefully he's living a great life. Um, I added this other photo of this seabird that's very much caught up in this plastic bag. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of other photos I could have shared, but um, I just went with these two. Um, and the other unfortunate news is on average, a million seabirds die from plastic ingestion or getting entangled in plastic every year. And at least two thirds of our world's fish stocks are suffering from plastic ingestion. Locally, um, fishing line plastic bags, balloons um, have all been shown to impact wildlife. Um, so there is also impacts to human health. I mentioned microplastics before. Um, so like I said, microplastics can absorb environmental toxins. Um, those can get eaten by phytoplankton. Fish can eat the phytoplankton. And then if um, a human catches that fish, um, they're also consuming those microplastics as well. So it bioaccumulates in the food chain. Um, other human health impacts of garbage is just generally garbage is dirty. It can carry bacteria, fungi, and other pathogens that could make people sick. Um, litter can also shred into sharp pieces and injure people. And then one of the other common things that we find in this area, unfortunately, is hypodermic needles, which can be both um, sharp and carry diseases as well. Um, and that homeowner that um, sent the photos from East Shore Drive also found hypodermic needles washing up on her property. Um, so then lastly, um, this is, we're gonna get more positive here, I swear. Um, there, there can be economic impacts to all of this plastic pollution. Not surprisingly, if this continues to happen, which it looks like it will, it could eventually reduce property values, especially for those who live along the waterways. Um, and it could, could also impact businesses um, who could see a loss of in re revenue um, if their business is impacted from all this plastic pollution washing ashore. All right, so tackling the issue, um, some of these are my favorite things. So the picture on the left is showing a storm drain outlet netting. Um, so these nets are able to fit around the outlet pipe. 
That way, anything that's washing into our storm drains can get caught in these nets and water is still able to make its way through. Then um, once these nets fill up like this, they can be detached and then um, the garbage can be pro properly disposed of. The next photo shows a trash run. This one's from the Anacostia watershed out east. Um, so sort of a storm water system where water is draining from an urban area um, into a local lake or river. They set up this trash run where um, the water is able to get through the grates, but the garbage is trapped trapped and then they can properly dispose of it. The top right photo is showing a um, water skimmer, which this one is called Mr. Trash Wheel. And um, it's kind of a fun way to clean up uh, garbage and debris from harbors or where like a river runs into the ocean or into a great lake. It's a great place to have one of these water skimmers that collects trash. Um, so another way to tackle this issue is enforcement. I found it interesting in 2019, Milwaukee um, increased their fines for littering up to $500. Um, the goal there is not to just give out a bunch of tickets, but it was part of their um, awareness campaign to really try to reduce the amount of people who are littering. Um, so of course, something like that is another option in some of our area municipalities. Um, other community initiatives we can do. Um, on the left, um, that is called a ballot bin. Um, this was designed and produced in the UK and you can just ask any sort of question you want and then people vote um, with their answer by um, putting in their cigarette butt. And it's just a more interactive way to get people to properly dispose of their cigarette butts. On the middle picture, we could just use more recycling and garbage bins. Um, in public spaces to have more people properly throw away their plastic pollution or garbage. And then the picture on the right shows a family who adopted a storm drain, which I would love to see this kind of program in the greater Green Bay area. Um, you generally just adopt a storm drain and keep it clean, keep um, garbage, debris, and other organic material like grass clippings and leaves out of the storm drain. And um, to tackle that fishing line or monofilament issue, some of these containers that are um, could be placed in um, at like harbors and boat launches um, for people to have a proper place to dispose of their fishing line when it gets tangled, and then they can be properly disposed of, and hopefully little crayfish do not get caught in there. Um, and then the picture on the right is showing um, a program from TerraCycle, which is. Um, a recycling company that is out there trying to recycle um, some of the, the trash that we have that's not generally recyclable. Like some, uh, they can recycle Capri Sun pouches, um, they can recycle cigarette butts, and what they do with this different kind of plastic um, is they can turn it into pellets, which is then used for um, creating benches or uh, garbage cans or other plastic products. Um, another way to tackle this issue is a public awareness campaign. I have an example of a um, billboard from Tennessee that says, nobody trashes Tennessee, litter adds up. And these are really fun on the right here, um, posters from Canada where um, they use garbage to spell out words. And then um, on the bottom, it says literally, littering says a lot about you. Um, uh, Fox Wolf has a new program, Adopt a Launch program, where volunteers will be tackling litter invasive species and other concerns at local waterways. Mm -hmm. And then, I, like, like I mentioned earlier, I coordinate the annual Fox Wolf Watershed Cleanup. I shared um, three, of the most, three photos from the most recent cleanup events. Um, and things I've learned is to make the events fun, make them free, um, provide all the supplies needed, and then use the event to, to share some of these educational messages about properly disposing of um, plastic pollution and other garbage. And then here are two infographics from our past to cleanup events. Um, we were, I was really excited in 2019 to have over a thousand volunteers participate. Um, and you can see um, all of the things that our volunteers cleaned up at six, more than 60 sites throughout our basin. And then I listed sites here on the right um, that are in the Green Bay area. And then my last slide. Um, so another thing, what we really need is just uh, more partners on this issue. Working together, we can, um, I think we can definitely see a reduction in the plastic pollution in our waterways. And I definitely encourage anybody who is interested in working with me on this issue to reach out. Great.
Nope. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'd like to invite the other uh, two speakers to join with their videos. Let's see, and I will bring up the questions. So uh, we definitely have some interesting questions to wrap up the morning here. I would pop up. Okay, the first question related to the PFAS. Um, are, what if any efforts are being made to clean up PFAS? Are there entities that created the PFAS or use them in their products that are being asked to provide funds for cleanup? Yeah, so um, I will say within Wisconsin, um, there are a bunch of different efforts that are being used to um, reduce PFAS in contaminated areas. Um, I am actually not part of the remediation and redevelopment um, group at DNR, but if you go to the PFAS website um, that DNR has, you can see there's um, like a link to all of our um, cleanup plans. And in terms of organizations that previously contributed PFAS to the environment. Um, I know that in other states, for example, in Minnesota, um, they have had some litigation with 3M um, along the Mississippi River. And in other areas, um, they have, you know, had these companies um, provide funds after litigation. But um, as far as I'm aware, that that's not something that's happening right now in Wisconsin. Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, is it safe to kayak or use a stand-up paddleboard in the Peshtigo River? Um, should we be concerned about recreation in general in these contaminated areas? Um, so I would say on the topic of PFAS, we're really not concerned about like the amount of PFAS you would get from just short-term ingestion like you would do in um, a recreational setting or um, absorption through the skin. Those really aren't um, pathways that we're that concerned about. Um, obviously, you don't want to be ingesting a huge amount of untreated surface water for a variety of reasons, not just PFAS. Um, but I would say stand-up paddle boarding, you know, fishing, swimming, boating, these are not things that we're um, concerned about from a PFAS exposure standpoint. Um, you know, other people who we're talking about HABs, that might be a more immediate um, concern, but from a PFAS standpoint, it's um, not a concern. Great, thank you. And maybe one last um, uh, health-related question. Uh, with PFAS, um, I've read that PFAS are in fleece clothing we wear and that with each washing we send PFAS into our water system. Is this true and what can we do to stop PFAS leaching from my fleece clothing into the into our water bodies? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question and honestly I don't know. I mean um, throughout their history PFAS has have been used in a lot of different applications and so I, I can't say whether or not it's um, you know, in your, your current fleece or fleece that you have had in your closet for a while. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to say I don't know about that one. Okay, I thank you. I can sort of answer part of that. So I'm obviously not the PFAS person, but um, that's one of the things I didn't mention in my presentation is that um, another source of microplastics is from washing our clothes with synthetic fibers. Um, so again, I don't know about PFAS, but washing our clothes, we are sending tiny microplastics, these synthetic fibers that then go to the wastewater treatment facility and they are not captured there and then get um, returned out to our local bodies of water. Um, our wastewater treatment facilities were not designed to capture these things. So as of right now, if we keep washing our clothes, it's really, it's going to just keep happening. Sure, and I and I guess um, I would just add that there are there are devices out there that you can hook up to your washing machine. They're filters. They are designed um, main mostly for septic systems because plastic uh, particles going in your septic system is not good for them. Also, but you can use them with a a washer that's hooked up to a wastewater treatment plant or a sewage system. Also, um, that actually filter out uh, all the small uh, particles from your clothing. 
as it washes. Um, how about a question, Kelly, since we're, you started talking. Um, this question comes, it says, can we require biodegradable shotgun wads? They are a big problem. They have been used, they used to be made of paper. I didn't know they used to be made of paper. That's kind of cool. Um, I would definitely agree that shotgun shell wads are a big problem. We are actually going to add them to our trash tally for our 2021 cleanup event because we just find so many of them. Um, one of our Clean Bay Backers members mentioned that um, they, someone is working on biodegradable shotgun shell wads. Um, and so hopefully we can see that happen because um, yeah, they're a big problem, a big source of plastic, especially in the Bay of Green Bay. Great. Um, and our last question, um, are there any communities or state legislators considering bans on single plastic, uh, single use plastic bags? Um, I would like to see more of that happen. Um, what I learned recently that is that many municipalities have bans on bans. So you, they already have it in place that bans can't happen in their communities. Um, so that would be definitely something um, hard to get around. Um, but I, again, I'd like to see more of that happen. I think my city, where I live in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I think my city is one of the cities that has a ban on bans, meaning that you can't um, suggest a ban or introduce a ban to the city for single use plastics. Great, thank you. And we do have a follow-up um, from our Cleanberry backer, Bruce Dedman, uh, that set, he says that, um, oh, it disappeared on me. <laughs> Okay. There are federal federal cartridge federal national cartridge company federal cartridge company is starting to work on this, but I'm sure I but I sure agree that it's a problem. So there are companies shop that are working on a biodegradable shotgun shell wads. So okay. So with that. Uh, that thank you very much. I'm going to wrap it up here a little bit, um, and that's that was our last of our questions. Uh, so we've come to the end of our event today. I wanted to just end you uh, with a positive message. Uh, we do have some serious water quality ch challenges, but we've also made some ex extremely amazing, successful strides um, in this area, and it's because there are a lot of great people dedicated to working on these issues and working together to find these solutions. We really. Uh, in the long term, we need leadership from our local elected officials and community leaders and um, really invest in that human capital that it takes to, to, to tackle these really complex problems. Um, I would like to thank a huge thank you to our speakers, uh, all of the attendees and participants that you took your time today uh, to be part of this event. If you feel inspired to join the Clean Bay Backers, please let us know and you can help out in the next year. We hope next year we'll be back to seeing people in person uh, and looking at our at the Bay and, and the Fox River again. Uh, we will be sending a reminder, I just want a reminder we, to check through your agenda packet. There's a lot of great information in there and speaker contact information and hopefully this webinar was recorded and we will be posting it and sending out that link in the future. So uh, thank you very much and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.